screen and select show subtitles. We also have a sign interpretation available during today's webinar. We will be spotlighting our American Sign Language interpreter throughout the sessions today. During the webinar, please put any questions or comments in the Zoom Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom app. We will be reviewing these and get through as many questions as we can. This webinar will be recorded. We will share the recordings with you shortly after this webinar. The MYT team are here to help you with any technical difficulties. Please use the Zoom chat facility to ask any technical questions or email the team at admin at sitesaversevents.com where MYT will be able to help you. We will begin with a short recording before handing over to Simon Brown. It has always been ringing behind my head. Will you fit in? How will our customers look at you? Many people think they are left out because of the impairments they have, but they are left out because the workplace is totally not accessible for them. Give us a chance. Give me a chance. Because most of them, they just look at you and judge you. My experience, I have always experienced a challenge in communication barrier. Every time I want to get an access to an office, there is that communication barrier. Sightsaver has been running World Cafes. They are creative focus group discussions. The sentiments that are expressed by the job seekers with disabilities, especially when they talk about their ambitions, their hopes and dreams are pretty much the same as those without disabilities. However, the challenges they express that they undergo when trying to find jobs are really great. This is someone who is trying to communicate, but there is a barrier here. What they are doing is they are drawing representations of their aspirations, their ambitions. They are also drawing challenges that they have gone through, as well as the message that they have for their private sector employers. Because they will know hmm. these are the kind of challenges these people have. Inclusion works very simply, builds the disability confidence of employers and the employment confidence of job seekers with disabilities and then acts as a bridge between the two. We've had staff with disability work amongst us over the years. It's been a journey of learning and relearning and unlearning. There are many things that we have believed that we knew and they have taught us a lot. I think there is a bit more work that we need to do and that is what we are being asked to look at. Sightsavers is encouraging employers to hold open days with people with disabilities because they provide the employers an opportunity to hear directly from the job seekers with disabilities. It also provides an opportunity for the job seekers with disabilities to interact with the employers and know that the employers are actually approachable. The fact that they were open for a discussion with us, that really changed a lot. Earlier on, I thought about Standard Chartered and uh, I thought, ah, no, it wasn't an employable environment, but that notion changed on that day. Well, the experience at Stern Chat was very exciting. First company opening up their doors to have such discussions on issues not everybody wants to discuss about that stood out for me. Populations which have more inclusive people with them do better in terms of business. But away from the research, we believe in Standard Chartered. It's simply the right thing to do. When I think about this country, there is a lot of goodwill. People want to do the right thing. We want to appeal to the private sector to have the face of Kenya in your organizations. The face of Kenya includes persons with disability. They should take advantage of the opportunities that have been opened by government in terms of incentives. We feel that persons with disability need to be contacted and give input on how best they should be accommodated in the society and not be spoken for. Persons with disabilities are looking for good jobs that they can make careers out of. And that's the opportunity for us in the private sector 
or in the public sector or in the non-government organizations to then come out and just make it happen. Hi Betty, we can't hear you at the moment, if we could ask you to unmute. I'm sorry, okay. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending where you are. Welcome to the Zero Partners channel session that is hosted by Site Servers. Um, Inclusive, uh, inclusion works features. My name is Betty Najemba. I work as the Organization of Persons with Disabilities Engagement Officer uh, for Africa um, here in Uganda. Because, okay, I'm going to present today through my sign language interpreter, she's Liz, because I'm a deaf person. So this project of Inclusion Works, it's a three-year project that is funded by UK Aid uh, that is evidencing how the labor market systems can be more inclusive of persons with disabilities in formal employment uh, in Bangladesh, Kenya, Nigeria, and also here in Uganda. Um, we have invested time in understanding how the labor market systems function in those four countries. So we are now focusing how to address the barriers that have excluded persons with disabilities from meaningful participation in, uh, in employment. So we all know the fundamental problem in the society and around the world where human rights violation has been there. But one thing that we have started addressing in the systematic way is building disability confidence um, and employer confidence around the world. So building the self-confidence and employment readiness for persons um, that are job seekers. So what we are doing right now, we are also focusing uh, on nurturing support systems, um, functions, and also the regulatory framework, which can promote and protect the employment rights of persons with disabilities. So what we do also, we have um, we have many stories to say, but I want to hand over to my colleague, um, uh, my co-host, Simon Brown from Site Servers, uh, to introduce to us a session. Uh, Simon, you're welcome. Thank you, Betty. That's very kind. And um, as Betty said, good morning, good, good afternoon, good evening to, to everybody around the world. And thank you for, for tuning in to, to this session. Um, my name is Simon Brown. I'm the Global Technical Lead for Economic Empowerment at Sightsavers. Um, what we've known um, well before the coronavirus is that the world of work, the world itself, becomes ever increasingly digital. If I go back decades ago, when I first started working in IT, um, in the early 1980s, when I worked for Barclays Bank, we already began, began to see the, the beginnings of that. Uh, 4G, the internet of things, and now 5G, and the internet of skills, as well as artificial intelligence and other technologies like distributed ledger, have fundamentally changed the future of work. 
And then along came the coronavirus with all of its health and economic uh, uh, crises and, and, and implications, um, but also came as a force in further accelerating technological changes um, in the way that we live our lives and in the way that we work. Distanced working has suddenly become a new normal, not necessarily beautiful, but a reality, and that distance from physical task and from colleagues is something we can at least live with. And so the combination of these two, the distancing and the digitalization, then presents quite an interesting potential proposition of leveling up for people with disabilities. Um, and that's going to be the focus of this, this session, the trends, the opportunities, but also the barriers this increasingly distanced and digitalized future of work presents for people with disabilities. And so I'm going to turn to, to first to, to Evans Manuri. Uh, Evans, as, as Standard Chartered Bank's Head of Human Resources in Kenya and East Africa, you are particularly well positioned to talk about a distanced and digital future. We, we first met um, in, in 2019 in Nairobi um, when you just returned from a, a fintech conference to give me some advice about the Kenyan labor market. But we also talked about the digitalization of banking and your strong feelings on the potential that offers for people with disabilities. So tell us more about it. What are those trends in the digitalization of, 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 of employment and business? And how has COVID possibly accelerated that future of work, both digitally and distance? And how does that relate to, to people with disabilities? So Evans, over to you. Thank you very much, Simon, and it's good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all of you and to all our friends, uh, especially from Asia, wherever you are, it's Gongji Fast Chai. Uh, Happy New Year, Happy New Chinese Year. As you celebrate that, I know it's your Eve. And thank you, Simon, for giving me an opportunity to uh, quickly just uh, share my thoughts on uh, the digital and the work of the future and how we are positioned. And true, yes, we did meet when I had just attended a fintech conference in Nairobi, having organized two or three days by our regulator, which is the Central Bank of Kenya. One of the key things that you will see in terms of trends, and when I think about Kenya and the financial industry, if you just look simply in the last one year, it's 2020 post COVID, you will just see some interesting perspectives coming through. 15 to 20% of jobs have been eroded. Workforce sent home and individuals redefining what they do every day. It is interesting that this trend did not start in 2020. It started earlier. And you, as you aptly put it, we've had an opportunity to rethink how we do business. We've thought about digital and, and what it presents in the past as an option. And I think I speak with authority having been in the financial industry for the last 16 years. We've looked at it as an option. It used to be an add-on to the things that we used to do. Last year, as we thought about COVID and what it did in terms of accelerating our journey to digital transformation, it enabled us to start rethinking that that is no longer an option, but the way of business. And of course, when I look at the workforce within Standard Charter today in Kenya, it's actually across, I can speak about Uganda and Tanzania as well, ab ab about 60, 70% of our workforce today are able to work from home comfortably. That was unheard of two or three years ago. We used to give that as an option and people never used to take it. Now it's a prerogative. 
and we are asking everybody to start rethinking on how to work flexibly, what of support they would need to work flexibly, more than now giving it as, as a, a small option in our workflow. It has become a big thing for us. And it's not just us, it is across the financial industry. Remember, the core of the industry still remains. We want to reach out to our clients. We still want to be ambitious about making money. We want to see uh, ourselves get into new frontiers and, and reach out new markets and so on. So that ambition remains. The balance, therefore, is then from what you say, Simon and I aptly agree, is then how we utilize the tools. And that's what technology is. It's giving us the platforms and the tools then to say, how, how do we utilize AI, distributed ledger, internet of things, and all these things to then capture our captive clients and customers and continue giving them the service they are looking out for. And, and I can tell you, when I look at the Kenyan market and the many things and I'm sure several other panelists will talk about this, clients now are the forefront of demanding for convenience. They're asking, can you please make it easy for me to get your service, to get your, your tools and so on. What I have seen, uh, uh, Simon, in the last couple of years has been a strategy of financial industry rethinking what they do. That now accelerated has given us two key opportunities. Number one, as you said, it has given us a springboard for new roles. Some jobs are falling away, and, and that is definitely expected, and many other jobs will continue falling away into the near future. However, it gives us an opportunity for very many new roles. And the question, and I think this is what I posed to you when we met, is what sort of help do we start to give to our people with disabilities, and not just them, it's actually a whole ecosystem on how do we accelerate new skill sets? We are talking about technical and humane skill sets. There is a lot of things that, uh, as you say, off the internet on what would be required. I know from a financial industry, we are thinking digital, we are thinking data. Those two big core things, and we're asking ourselves, how do we actualize those two first from a technical perspective and them being roles? And then sec secondly, how do we retain the humanness of the systems that we are getting into as we serve our clients? When I think about that, I see a huge clean platform for us to play. If you think about it, some of the barriers that we will highlight and we have seen in the past, one of them has been mobility. And that with COVID-19 coming into play, for me, it quickly shifts into an opportunity. We are able now to have persons with disability who work with us within Standard Chartered Bank sitting at their homes and they are able to deliver. Of course, there is system capability behind it that we have to keep working towards. And, and that's a challenge that I would throw out there. How do we utilize that opportunity now to then get as many people within our populace? Remember, and as a video you have shown is, we do have a huge database of people living with disabilities in my own country that have not been accommodated in the formal work sector. This is the opportunity to start thinking, here we go, because that mobility barrier has quickly been removed. The second one and um, you know, is co-creation and collaboration. The products that we knew in the past or possibly geared towards one level of clients. Now, those individuals with uh, disability need to help us co-create those level of products. And that's where my focus is when I think about Standard Chartered as well as the financial industry. So we feel those two, I think it is an opportunity for us to co-design, co-curate, and think about people with disabilities coming into our workforce better and provide the opportunities for them as they provide the opportunities to redefine our product and skill set going into the future. And that's what I see. Lastly, Simon, I will, I will fail if I don't finish with uh, an African saying. You know, and I love saying this within Standard Chartered Bank, there is a saying that goes that, that not everyone who chased the zebra caught it, but he who caught it chased it. It is our opportunity now to really catch our zebra as the opportunity for us 
present itself to do things differently for people with disabilities. Thank you very much. Wow. Thanks, Evans. That's that's very uh, visual thoughts and, and fantastic. Um, and we'll come back to you in a little while, um, no doubt, with some questions from 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 the audience uh, uh, who will post them in the Q and A box. Um, but but um, you've you've given us a great transition to 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 Palak, um, uh, uh, from from Accenture Development Partnerships. Palak, one of the um, focuses of Inclusion Works in Kenya is now piloting an IT skills academy in Nairobi in partnership with the German development agency GIZ. Um, as, as this is a technical industry recognized qualification in IT networking and cybersecurity and very much aligned to what Evans was saying around the acquisition of new skill sets. Now Accenture Development Partnerships is part of this pilot and you, in particular, are leading the research in the, the trends in demands for these kinds of skills, but also the potential financing of these academies, which help bridge young people with disabilities to be more competitive in this new digital and distanced world of work. Can you tell us what the early parts of that research is, is revealing? Palak, over to you. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, and greetings, everyone. Happy Chinese New Year to our participants from China. Um, if we go on to the first slide, and Simon, I would like to share my research in two parts. Firstly, I'd like to talk about uh, what is the big opportunity here when we look at skilling persons with disabilities with workforce of the future. And the second part is how do we sustain models that provide for that opportunity? I think it is no news to anybody that ICT industry in Kenya is rapidly growing. Just last year, I was reading a report which said that the industry grew by 12.9% in just a matter of a year, and it is pegged to be valued at $1.7 billion in 2022. So the opportunity is huge. And obviously with a growing sector, one thing very natural to come is a lot of jobs. And I think Evans mentioned that Certain jobs have been lost and certain new jobs have been created. The question that we tried to then answer was that if there are jobs, do we have the right kind of skill sets to service those jobs? And a very short answer to that question is maybe not. World Economic Forum did a survey in 2018 and rated Kenya 101 out of 130 countries when it comes to readiness for skills of the future. And that is a huge gap over there. They also interviewed many, many corporate players in Kenya, asking them, what is one of the big impediments to your business growth? And 30% mentioned that it is having the right kind of skill sets and also uh, not having a workforce of the future. So that, of course, is one big challenge that we all have in front of us. But I guess we have an opportunity to spin that challenge and look at it as a huge potential that we can service. I would now slowly like to maybe shift towards looking at how do we solve for this or what is the big opportunity when we look at persons with disabilities. So let's, let's look at what their current status is. I'm talking about just less than 1% of the population that is currently employed in formal sector as compared to 73.9% of the population in Kenya who belong to the general category who have jobs in formal employment. And it's a huge challenge. We interviewed many folks from this segment. We also talked to some of our peers who have, who are advancing this cause and championing this cause uh, since many years. And they mentioned that even though Kenyan government has come up with uh, guidelines that corporate should have 5% of their workforce from the disability segment, yet less than 1% is featured over there. We saw in the video that challenges around social stigma, challenges around biases, which are such so deeply rooted, um, sort of prevent the segment from getting jobs. Also the fact that currently the kind of jobs that are out there are very entry level, which eventually ends up stagnating their careers. So if you just zoom out of this situation and see what we see is an ICT sector that is booming, that is growing, which needs skill force, uh, the skill sets of the future. And then we also see this 
segment, which has a lot of potential, by the way. However, do not have the right kind of skill sets. And that is where I believe academies like Bridge come into play to provide the right kind of platform where cutting edge IT skills can be taught in data science and coding and can give them an equal opportunity. Now, the second question, which we tried answering through our research is that on paper, these models look excellent, but how do they sustain themselves? And if you move to the next slide, you'll see that globally, Many such organizations exist which are trying to either provide for that employment gap or trying to help them get the right kind of education. And most of these models are currently reliant on grant funding, funding through development agencies, funding through governments and even corporate partners. And a very few mature models um, are trying to experiment with a self-sustaining system where they develop a minimum viable product through their services and then look to monetize their services through the corporates. If you go to the next slide, we try to see that whether academies like Bridge can survive in, um, whether they can survive in Kenya or not, what sort of funding does Kenya attract? And what we saw was that it is one of the hotbeds when we look at development aid, and especially a lot of money from the likes of World Bank, from the likes of uh, FDCO, USAID, flows in, in billions of dollars for the cause of education, for the cause of youth empowerment. So that is one pool that we can definitely tap into. Alongside, even government of Kenya channelizes some funding towards the cause of disability. Not to say everything is available for skilling, but definitely a portion of that is available to be used for higher education, for employment, for entrepreneurship, so on and so forth. And I think we would all have heard the National Council of Persons with disabilities trying to pioneer this cause. Corporate foundations are also doing their bit by contributing. I would like to mention that while all these funds are out there, they definitely provide a great starting point for organizations to tap into, get their feet, develop that minimum viable product. But in the long run, we eventually want to move to a model where these academies can create a product, can create that 360 degree value to corporates by co-creating the solutions for them and eventually monetizing their services, um, which can help them sustain in the long run, also expand their scope in the long run. Um, and I think with that, I'll probably just stop and happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you and Simon, over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Palak. Um, now, Amber, I want to turn to you. Um, so it is really clear what we have heard from Evans and Palak that there is a great opportunity, but also um, facing some realities, acquiring uh, digital skills. Some people with disabilities have access, they have access to technology and internet. So there is also need to know that there is a very, very significant barrier for persons with disabilities in access to technology and the internet. But also because the International Disability Alliance, one of uh, the partners involved in, in the Inclusion Works program because it has been investing time in doing the research on those barriers which, um, which exclude persons with disabilities from accessing technology. Now, as we talk through the key findings, um, Amber, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betty. It is a true pleasure to be invited to share our experiences on this very timely discussion. The International Disability Alliance is a global alliance of organizations of persons with disabilities with eight global and six regional members. They in turn have membership of, over, of organizations in over 183 countries. Our focus areas include advocacy towards the UN, capacity building of organizations of persons with disabilities, as well as supporting disability inclusive development programming and humanitarian action. 
the impact of underrepresented groups of persons with disabilities receiving support to attend in-person trainings alongside their peers is tremendous. They have opportunity to build social capital, uh, to exchange ideas and also gain confidence in presenting and facilitating trainings. And this is where our experiences are coming from. There's an impact on the disability movement as well, recognizing the value of their perspectives and understanding how to support their participation, which has been reflected most recently in an external evaluation of one of our training initiatives, the Bridge CRPD SDGs training program. The same could be said about workspaces and persons with disabilities as well. The pandemic and resulting lockdowns meant that our entire capacity building strategy had to go online. This was a challenge on two fronts. One was regarding accessibility of various platforms available to us, and the other was access to steady, adequate speeds of internet for the majority of DPOs based in the global south. Though the majority involved themselves in all opportunities for discussion, we are aware that many that we were able to reach through our in-person trainings were not able to join in. We attempted to present these barriers and foster discussion at a panel discussion held alongside the Conference of States Parties, which we will be publishing soon. Uh, but in summary, the experience of our first panelist there, Pradeep Sinha, of the Society of the Empowerment of the Deaf Blind in India was sadly common. He was forced to move in with his family during the lockdown in a different city. He had no interpreter in the city willing to work with him in person for this webinar. Uh, his device was unable to read captions, as captions you are all enjoying right now, from the webinar. But with the support of a remote uh, interpreter in another city, he was able to share findings related to his members, many of them having assistive devices, but they were in waiting for repairs for months. Many of the government provided devices were incompatible with modern technology, and there was a huge compromise they all experienced to the relative independent living that they were able to join before this. Moses Servada of the Uganda Federation of the Hard of Hearing spoke about the role of technology in facilitating public participation during the pandemic and how these mechanisms ended up excluding persons with disabilities. Now, the views of persons with disabilities from the global south and their pandemic experiences, the reflection of these have been curtailed by issues relating to accessibility, affordability of internet, and also availability of information in plain sign and local languages. At IDA, the uh, development of an accessible survey platform called iData was very crucial for our stakeholders. This platform now hosts the Global Disability Survey on COVID-19 in several languages and international sign. Rosario Galarza of Riadis narrated their experiences of introducing an online course for their members and understanding the accessibility needs of participants. The diversity of experiences of online learning has been something that we at IDA have been observing very closely, especially as we are in process of developing our own online platform as well, meant to be fully inclusive. This procurement process took five months and deep involvement of our members in testing. Persons with disabilities have been known to be innovative in our daily lives. It's kind of the way we survive, but this gets a lot harder for those groups that aren't the ones that are thought of when people are designing and engineering solutions. They remain underrepresented in discussions around inclusion and accessibility as well. So when we look to the future of work, it becomes imperative to think about what this means for underrepresented groups and to ensure that the solutions and actions that we take are reflective of the diversity of the movement. Uh, so I think with those with those initial thoughts, I'd like to hand it back to Betty. Thank you very much once again. I will be posting a few links in the chat box to some of the things that I spoke about. Thank you. Betty, you're on mute. Your interpreter's on mute. Sorry. 
Uh, thank you once again, Amber, for that great insight. Now, members, we have heard that terminology, the underrepresented groups. So I want to break it down. So those are persons that include uh, persons with intellectual disability, then psychosocial disability, um, then uh, persons that are living with deaf blindness. Those have been excluded for a very long time. That's why uh, International Disability Alliance has been making an effort to make them included in all programs. So I want now to, to invite Brian, because we have heard the, the, uh, that it's very, very important to hear. We've also heard about the theory from all the panelists, yes, we have heard. So what... So now we need to know what, what can be done? For example, we also have to think about the question, what can be done to leave no one behind? And uh, for, for everyone and also the youth with disabilities. I also want to talk about uh, the expectations for the future and what, what is it that we need to do in order to make uh, the future inclusive. Uh, so Brian, over to you, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Betty, and thank you everyone for joining us. It's a privilege and honor to be able to speak here today. My name is Brian Emanuel from Kenya, and I'm a disability rights self-advocate with a psychosocial disability. In August, 2019, Kenya conducted uh, its eighth population housing census. People with disabilities were considered using the Washington group questions, where 3.7% of the men and 3.9% of women had an impairment, the youth included. I believe that it is essential to note that it is in rural areas that more individuals with disabilities live than in urban areas. This implies that we have a substantial percentage of disabled youth who are unable to access not only educational opportunities, employment, but also reliable internet connectivity. This is due to marginalization and poverty. Why is this data relevant? It's because the, the exclusion and marginalization of persons with disabilities is a challenge. It's a challenging reality for many countries in Africa, as well as an economic and human rights issue. Digital technologies have been able to break the traditional barriers to communication, employment opportunities, connectivity, and availability of information. And this is a window of opportunities for we persons with disabilities to be included and genuinely feel that we are part of a functioning uh, society. In reaction to the escalation of the COVID-19 pandemic, steps have been adopted by governments worldwide during this pandemic. Many people with disabilities, including myself, have been affected positively and negatively by some of these developments. And you can agree it has done unpredictable uh, things to us. I firmly believe these modifications have the ability to increase accessibility to formal and informal jobs, education. And this is an opportunity for young persons with disability. So, Connectivity is one crucial thing to realize this. We have limited access to di digital technology, especially in low and middle income countries. In this shift in the paradigm of technology enabled growth, those who have the privilege of accessing internet connectivity have been able to explore new horizon in work and job opportunities. It serves as a guarantee that ensures opportunities for young people with disabilities in the near future. This is what leaving no one behind means to me and my fellow youth with disabilities. When it comes to my expectations for the future and what it is we need to do to make our futures inclusive, we recognize that in all countries across the world, we as persons with disabilities constitute a vulnerable community in the labor market and are often more likely to be unemployed, underemployed, or economically inactive than persons without disabilities. Although there are obvious solutions, 
part of these responses lies in fostering equal opportunities. And with the new normal, I feel like we should invest more in building back better opportunities by providing connectivity, digitalization, and imparting digital empowerment to young people with disabilities. Under the provisions of the Article 27 of the UNCRPD, for countries that have signed and ratified this convention, we have a duty to work towards an accessible, inclusive future for all, and this is everyone's responsibility. And let's acknowledge that today we have done the necessary, tomorrow we'll do what is possible, and suddenly we shall have achieved the impossible. Thank you so much, Betty, and that was my time. Thank you, Brian. Um, I think this was really important to, to, to hear your voice um, and, and your expectations. Um, and um, we'll, we'll um, for, for sure um, ask to, to, uh, to, to, to come back to some of that in a while. Um, but now we're going to move to a little bit around the questions, questions and answers. Um, and um, there's, there's, an, there's a Q&A box uh, that's that's available for those who are joining via the Zoom link, where you can post your questions. There's a, there's a few questions in there, um, and this is an opportunity to ask the the, the panelists um, for some clarification or for or to, to stimulate some 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 more discussion. Um, I'm going to ask. Um, so please do do make use of that that Q and A box. We've got about ten minutes, so we can get through a, a few a few questions. Um, but let me ask the first question, direct the first question that's that's come there to 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 Evans. Evans, there's there's somebody um, I can't see who who actually asked the question, but uh, but he or she is asking. I see a risk for corporates as they manage profits versus hiring multi-skilled individuals which may be that job seekers with disabilities may not be multi-skilled or have high level skills. So what happens or should happen when it comes to bringing on board people with disabilities into formal employment? Um, what can corporates do and commit to? Maybe that's the, the, the crux of the, of, the, of, the, of the question right at the end. What can corporates do or commit to? And that's, that's, that's a good question, Simon. The reality of that question cannot be overemphasized. We have lived with it and done nothing with it. I am a strong believer that even institutionalizing laws and saying, in our example, in East Africa, that even As we speak through the topic of sustainability for many corporates today, to realize we cannot talk about sustainability when we are not inclusive. That it has to start there. And then we must get individuals and champions within our corporates, our institutions that strongly believe this is the way to go. Anything that is enforced by the law has an end date, it expires somewhere. But anything that is driven from the heart is sustainable. So I think that's the first level. But the reality on the ground is this, is we've got to start somewhere. And that somewhere is possibly the law itself, that we've got to start by institutionalizing and saying, how do we get a fair level of people with disabilities into our workspaces? The example of Standard Chartered today and what I have committed to, which is a challenge I keep giving the corporates that we work closely with, is just start somewhere and pick a number. Don't be given the number, pick a number. What makes sense for you within your structures and follow that closely. Standard Charter this year is working with local universities here in Kenya to bring on board interns as we start thinking and rethinking our workforce in terms of including persons with disabilities. The last time we were here when we were doing uh, that conversation we had at the very first um, open day for people with disabilities in a corporate. So it's got to start somewhere. What I see is corporates need to accelerate the conversation. And that's a challenge I'll give to corporates, but there is a great opportunity to then commit it to, to something. 
Thank you, Evans. That's, that's, that's great. Um, I, I'm going to ask the next question to, to Amber. Amber, Harriet um, Knowles has, has, has asked uh, actually a number of questions, but let me take one of them to, to start with. Um, how do we support people with invisible disabilities to take part in the virtual workforce? Um, their needs may not always be visible, obvious to their employers. And, and so, so that whole um, session you, that you've led us through around leaving no one offline and certainly leaving no one behind, um, how, do we, how do we support people with, uh, let's say, less visible disabilities to take part in the virtual workforce? And, and particularly around their, 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 their specific needs. Thank you for the question. I think that one of the, often it gets conflated that if you, you know, that persons with, uh, you know, with, visible, with disabilities which are less visible or not apparent do not have issues with working from home. As somebody who falls into that category of persons with disabilities, I can tell you that there is quite a bit. Um, but I would say that, you know, it's really important that you ask the individual about their support needs. It is not that there is a manual which will tell you what to do. I think that that's true for all persons with disabilities that we really need to have an open discussion and have something where a person can talk about their reasonable accommodation needs um, that they experience. And this could change. For example, when we started working from home, I anticipated my needs to be a certain couple of things, but then I found that this changed and this will change depending on the kind of family support you have and the other kinds of facilities available to you. So if I had to just say one thing as a takeaway, consult with people with disabilities themselves. We know what we need uh, and we know what we can, uh, you know, what we, we, we would need support with. So that's what's my takeaway. Thank you. Thanks, Amber. Um, Brian, um, if, if, if you wouldn't mind, I think you've already talked a lot to, the, to this, this next question, but I think it's still a very important question. As you, as you have explained the expectations and the barriers of, of particularly young people with disabilities, this question is asked from a, a Kenyan context. Um, what do you see as really important in terms of ensuring that both um, rural as well as urban youth can take advantage of the growing uh, IT sector? Um, or is there still very much a, a focus on urban and we forget about rural? Um, could you add anything to that, yeah, around the rural context of youth with disabilities and the digitalization of work? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Simon. So the reality is uh, the young persons with disabilities or persons with disabilities collectively who live in rural areas are subjected to a lot of uh, stigma and discrimination and this uh, denies them accessibility to education, uh, to information. And, and this makes them uh, be less advantaged when it comes to, to to seeking jobs or having equal opportunities to others. And the other thing is that we have to keep in mind that also there are rural settings where there is no connectivity uh, because of uh, such things as uh, there is no electricity and all that. So, uh, so these people, uh, who, who, these persons with disabilities who live in rural areas are with no doubt uh, disadvantaged. And I feel the first thing that will be, will, will, the first thing that will help them is, is uh, apart from information and anti-stigma campaigns, we should also recognize them as persons who are equal to others and they, are, they have a right to education, information, and all these things that to them is a privilege so that they can be able to, to reintegrate with society and be able to play a role in their societies which I feel they have been denied because people ignore that they also have skills and they have talents that can be of great benefits to the formal and informal sectors. Thank you, Brian, that's, that's brilliant. Um, we've, we've come to the end of the, of, the, of the time that we can allocate to Q&As. I know there's more 
questions that have been posted, and we will try to to, to answer those in in in, in other ways. Um, but we wanted to 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 um, end the session um, with a second film. This one from Nigeria, um, which again gives some perspectives on digital futures, um, but also in the future of work in general through the voice of both employers, but also people with disabilities. So we'll just transition to the film um, and, um, and, 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 uh, and watch that. Thank you very much. Inclusion Works is transforming the labor market system. We are creating disability confident employers, building employee confidence and the readiness of job seekers with disabilities. Disability for me does not affect anything. The appraisals that we get speaks for itself. My name is Ogali Amono. This is my workplace and I'm proud to work with a disability friendly organization such as Ikeja Electric. My name is Oluabu Fala Akinshela. This is my workplace. I have a disability called cerebral palsy. It affects my speech and my motor movement. Coming into professional banking world was my greatest.